In this video, we'll go through an overview of everything you need to build a multiplayer game, starting with the basic building blocks. We'll look at the difference between several network topologies like local multiplayer, LAN, peer-to-peer, -peer, and dedicated servers. After that, we'll design the architecture for our own multiplayer game loosely based on Fall Guys, and we'll look at the technologies available out there today. Throughout this series, we'll build and deploy our own real-time multiplayer game similar to Fall Guys, where up to 60 players can join a match and compete in various parkour challenges. But first, we need to understand the principles required to build something that complicated, and that's what this is for. We have a community Discord server, so definitely come hang out and feel free to ask any questions there. Alright, so let's go over the basic building blocks of a typical multiplayer game. At the lowest level, we have a transport layer that is responsible for actually sending data, the ones and zeros that make up your game, back and forth across the internet. Data is sent over the network for all sorts of things, like synchronizing player movement, attacks and animation, health, particle effects, game state, and so on. It's the foundation for a multiplayer game. On top of that are your game client and game server applications. If you're using Mirror, both are built in Unity, but there are many games that use a separate application for the server. Anyways, this involves all the additional code used to create the game simulation itself and manage the game state. On the back end of a multiplayer game, you have all the services powering the game. So this includes things like matchmaking, player authentication, databases, and third-party APIs like Steam or PlayFab. Finally, we have our fleet of dedicated servers that are used to host games. Here, we need to worry about things like scaling the fleet if there's a sudden surge of players, how to manage updates and patches that we need to roll out, and maintenance of the fleet to make sure that the servers are running 24-7 and as efficiently as possible. Back in the day, you would have had to manage those servers yourself on premises, but nowadays you'd be pretty crazy to not have your fleet in the cloud, considering how much of a headache it is to maintain your own servers. You also get a lot of amazing features and global distribution if you go with a cloud provider. Anyways, when you look at a multiplayer game, you can see that it's not really one specific program or application. Instead, it's a distributed system that needs to be carefully designed and built in order to provide the best experience possible for the player. Let's take a look at some of the most common and network topologies used for multiplayer games, starting with local multiplayer. Local multiplayer, which you might have heard referred to as couch multiplayer, is by far the simplest to understand and the easiest to implement. Smash, Mario Kart, and several Call of Duty games are all examples of games with a local multiplayer mode. These are games that can be played on the same machine on the same screen, such as a TV. If we look back at our building blocks, the only thing involved here is a client application. You don't even need to connect to the internet for these games, so there's no need for the transport or the back end or the fleet. The way you'd build a local multiplayer game is similar to the way you'd build any other single player game, except you just have to handle inputs from more than one player. There's many advantages to going with a local multiplayer game, like the fact that there's literally zero latency because you've got no networking going on. It's super simple and since you're not paying for bandwidth or servers, there's also no additional cost associated with this topology. The downsides are pretty obvious though, you can only really have up to around 4 players per game as any more would clutter your screen. There's also the obvious in-person limitation here since you've got to be in the same place in order to play together. LAN games are played in the same location on a local area network, and they were really popular back in the day with games like Quake and Unreal Tournament, when online multiplayer was still in its early days. LAN parties are still a thing though, and many games do have a LAN mode, so it's definitely not obsolete. As for our building blocks, LAN games don't use the internet at all, so the backend services and fleet aren't needed. But since we need to connect multiple different devices, there will be client and server applications built on top of a transport layer. LAN games come with many of the same advantages as local multiplayer games, like minimal latency, uh, not zero because data is being transmitted across devices, but since you're so close together, the latency will be so small that for all practical purposes, you can basically consider it to be about zero. There's also no additional cost as we don't have backend services to rely on, nor a fleet of dedicated servers, but LAN is more complex than local multiplayer implementation wise, but in the big picture of things, it's still a relative simple. Another benefit of LAN is that you can have large games, which is something you can't do with couch multiplayer. The big downside with LAN though, obviously, is that you're limited to playing with people in the same location. Next up is peer-to-peer, -peer, and this is where things start to get interesting. When people say peer-to-peer -peer in the context of games, they're really referring to one of these two topologies. The first one is direct peer-to-peer, -peer, where every player is connected to every other player. This is sort of the purest definition of peer-to-peer -peer from a networking point of 
view, while the other peer-to-peer -peer topologies are really just client-server in disguise. Direct peer-to-peer -peer is cheap, but it's a bit of a mess for multiplayer games, as you have to deal with this huge data transfer web where each player communicates with everyone else, and this can really complicate the implementation. Direct peer-to-peer -peer also doesn't scale very well, and there are also some security concerns because every player's IP address is exposed to everybody else. In general, I just wouldn't go with direct peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, I can't really think of a use case where you'd prefer this over player-hosted client-server, which is next up. So player-hosted client-server is what people really mean when they say peer-to-peer. -peer. In this model, one of the players runs both the client and the server applications and basically acts as a host. This centralizes the traffic, which significantly simplifies the implementation. Also, if we look at our building blocks, we'll need everything but the server fleet, as we're using the players to host games. This means we can really cheap out and save a lot of money, but there are some pretty big problems with player-hosted client-server. The first big issue is that everyone isn't treated fairly. The host can have an advantage because they're running on zero latency, and depending on how far apart everyone is, some players might be totally screwed while others get lucky. Also, what happens if the host rage quits or leaves the game? Either the game just drops, or you have to deal with migrating the host, which abruptly interrupts the game, and again, depending on where everyone is located, it could totally ruin the experience for some players. Host migration is also really difficult to implement properly. Another problem with player-hosted client-server is cheating. In this type of topology, Topology, it's basically impossible to completely prevent the host from cheating. Since the server is running on their machine, they can more or less do whatever they want to, and there's very little you can do to stop them. Personally, I would try to avoid player-hosted games because of the bad user experience, but there is a lot of money to save here, so I understand why many games go this route. Last, but definitely not least, we have the dedicated server model. In this model, we control and manage the servers, whether they're on-prem or in the cloud. We can make the servers as powerful powerful as we want, we can choose how many servers we want, and we can flexibly scale up or down our fleet. We can also control where we want the servers to be located, so that no matter where you play from, you can have a great experience. And since it's us, not the players, controlling the servers, we can ensure a much greater level of security and reliability. Unfortunately, in order to get these sweet, sweet benefits, we're going to have to pay up. Since we also have to deploy, manage, and ensure our servers are running 24-7, we also have to deal with additional complexity. But if you're looking to give players the best possible experience, dedicated servers are 1000% the way to go. Now that we've covered the major network topologies used in multiplayer games, let's look at what a sample multiplayer game's actual architecture might look like. For this, I'm going to assume our game is similar to Fall Guys, as we'll be building a game roughly inspired by Fall Guys later in the series. So right away we can draw out some requirements. We'll need to support up to 60 players per game, just like the real Fall Guys. We'll also need to make sure our system can handle real-time gameplay, movement, and physics. We'll need various backend systems like matchmaking, a friendless system, and leaderboards. We'll also need to store all kinds of player data, like items, skins, achievements, and stats. Lastly, we'll also want to track some analytics. Things like engagement, which translates to the daily active users or monthly active users, retention, growth, revenue, and so on. Okay, now if we want to support up to 60 players per game with real-time movement and physics, we're just going to have to go with dedicated servers. There's just no way we can have this be player hosted without the gameplay turning into absolute trash. So, we'll need a fleet of dedicated game servers. How do we do this? Well, we have plenty of great options if we choose to go with the cloud. There's Amazon GameLift, which is a dedicated game server hosting service that makes it pretty easy to deploy, manage, and scale servers on top of AWS, which is Amazon's cloud platform. There's also Azure PlayFab, which is by Microsoft, and their hosting service also makes it very easy to manage a dynamically scaled fleet of servers on their cloud service, Azure. Lastly, there is the Google Cloud Platform, or GCP, which also has a game server hosting service built on top of Kubernetes, which is a massively popular technology in the industry used to automate the deployment, scaling, and orchestration of clusters of servers. There's many other platforms for game server hosting out there, but these three are, in my opinion, by far the best based on functionality and ecosystem, and you can't really go wrong with any of them. As for pricing, it's very difficult to give you a precise cost because it depends on your needs, but all three are more or less in the same ballpark. 
Player authentication is at the core of every multiplayer game. Nowadays, players want the option to authenticate in a convenient and natural way. And depending on the platform and distribution method you're aiming for, you'll want to use the authentication provider that's most relevant for your game. Obviously, you can still have the typical username and password or email and password as options, but it's very common to allow players to link other accounts. In my opinion, PlayFab blows everything else out of the water. They provide integrations with Steam, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitch, and so on. And you don't have to worry about managing authentication data or databases. Their API is really nice. If you want to build a player authentication and identity service on your own, that's also an option, but do note that it'll be significantly more work. Matchmaking is probably the most complex part of a multiplayer game's backend. So let's quickly go over what actually happens in the matchmaking process, and then we'll talk about the best solutions available. So when a player or a group of players wants to play together, one player creates a matchmaking ticket and submits it to a matchmaking queue. The matchmaking service is responsible for filling a match using these tickets based on a set of rules. It'll also try to place you in a match offering the lowest latency so that players can enjoy a consistent gameplay experience. Once a potential match is made and accepted by all the players, the matchmaking service will try to place the match on one of the servers in your fleet. After that, the matchmaking service will send a start request to a game server along with some additional data. Once the server receives that request, it'll start up a new game session for the match. And when it's ready to accept players, it'll notify the matchmaking service. Once the game session is ready, the matchmaker will update all of the players' tickets with connection information and additional data. And once that's relayed back to each player, client, players will join the game, host it on the server, and start playing. So you can see this is a pretty complicated process and implementing a lot of this functionality can be extremely difficult on your own. And that's why you should probably use an existing matchmaking service. In my opinion, the best game matchmaking services out there are Flexmatch, which is part of Amazon Gamelift, PlayFab Matchmaking, and OpenMatch, which is an open source matchmaking framework by Google. By now, I know you're probably tired of hearing Amazon, Microsoft, and Google over and over again, but they really are doing a lot for multiplayer gaming. Anyways, uh, so our overall architecture will look something like this now, where clients communicate both with the matchmaking service and with the authentication service, as well as directly connecting to individual servers in our fleet when joining games. Now, we'll need some sort of friendless service to manage each player's list of friends, as well as connect friends from their linked accounts from Steam, Xbox, PlayStation, Facebook, or wherever else. Depending on what connected platforms you need, you may have to stitch together a few different APIs and build your own service, or you can go with PlayFab's friendless service, which is really nice and comes with all sorts of integrations. In our architecture diagram, we'll just group our friends in matchmaking services, so we can sort of call this the service layer. Okay, so leaderboards are similar to friendless in that we can build our own, but a simple way to start out would be either with the Steamworks leaderboards API, or again, PlayFab's leaderboards API. Both are nice and simple to use, although the Steamworks API is obviously restricted to Steam games only. A quick side note is that for large AAA games, there is a lot more involved here. For example, League of Legends processes petabytes of data, so their ranking systems are much more complicated, both because of the scale, but also because of the real-time requirements. I believe their data warehouse architecture is built on AWS, so take from that what you will. However, any small to medium-sized game should be able to get away with using a simple third-party solution, so we'll just go with that for now. Another core piece of multiplayer games is the need to manage persistent data, like player items and purchases, achievements, statistics, and so on. To do this, we'll need to use a database. For our game, we can use a simple SQL database hosted on one of the major cloud platforms. I'd recommend using a service like Amazon Aurora, Google's Cloud SQL, or the Azure database for Postgres. These are managed databases, so a lot of the time-consuming and error-prone tasks are automated away for us, like backups, for example. Since we don't want game clients to directly query and interact with our database because of security issues, we'll have a custom API layer deployed on simple virtual machines that provides us with game data from our database, but in JSON format over HTTP. This gives gives us easier access and more control over our data, and in the future, we could even split these up into separate services. Each of the major cloud providers provides VMs, but I'll leave it at that, since databases and APIs are large topics in their own right, and I don't want to go too in-depth here. 
So for analytics, my personal favorite is GameAnalytics.com because of its ease of use and functionality. It comes with things like event and metric tracking, reports, dashboards, as well as some really nice A-B testing features and user segmentation. All right, with that, we've finished designing the architecture for our sample real-time multiplayer game. Later in this series, I'll have videos dedicated to each part of this as we build our own multiplayer game, roughly based on Fall Guys, using Unity and the Mirror Networking Library. Anyways, that's it for this video. I did put a ton of effort into this one, so I hope it comes in use for you. But anyways, I have our Discord link below, so definitely join that and come hang out, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.